AI? Should we be more afraid of working with robots or the people who design them? But now, um, I wanted to invite our next, next guest, Ian Neely. Ian is a creative director at Google Zoo and a self-professed tech addict with a passion for solving real-world problems with technology and human insight. Based in Sydney, Ian works with global brands, clients, and agency partners, helping shape their digital strategy and creative direction across Google's products and platforms. Please welcome Ian. Thanks, George, for having me down. Um, I think I need to start by apologizing for my voice. <coughs> I didn't go out last night, I promise. Uh, I was recently in uh, Central America for a holiday and uh, went volcano boarding, which is great, but uh, inhaled a lot of uh, volcanic dust and stones. So it's not contagious, so if you see me afterwards and you want to talk to me, you don't have to stand far away. We can, uh, we can, we can be closer than that. But I apologize if uh, I start having a coughing fit or uh, the coding kicks in and I uh, start dribbling. <coughs> um, so, my name's Ian, I work uh, at Google, which is great, and I work in a team called The Zoo, which is even better. Uh, we're an internal creative department uh, that helps Google's brands and agencies, uh, sorry, brands and clients and agencies do better work with uh, Google. I wanted to quickly talk through um, some of the things, what we are basically, some of the things we've worked on the last year, and then wrap up by talking through the process that we use to identify opportunities, uh, how we solve problems for visitors, and then how we, uh, how we help agencies execute that stuff. So what is Google Zoo? Uh, as I said, we're a little internal creative department within Google. Um, I get this question a lot, so I should be better at answering it, but in the typical Google way, we, uh, we like to iterate a lot, so it's changed a few times since I've been, <coughs> been at Google. Uh, currently, we're called the Creative Think Tank for Brands and Agencies, which is uh, basically what I think when I see that, is what the fuck does that mean? Uh, it's twofold. <coughs> we explore creative uses of Google's tools, services, and platforms, and then we help agencies and brands be more successful in the digital space. It's basically the same thing because we can't do one without the other. Uh, a nice to scale map, thanks to my designer. We, uh, the team that I look after works uh, in Tokyo, Singapore, and Sydney. Uh, we're about 19 strong in that area. Uh, globally, we're about 200, but as you can see, we're kind of like down here the bottom of the world so we can be the cheeky and do stuff that the other guys can't. We're about six people uh, in Sydney, which is great. So what's an advertising creative doing at a technology company? Which is the second question I usually get, um, and it's a good one. Uh, we watch a lot of YouTube videos, which is kind of what we're doing in the creative space, uh, which is great, uh, but basically we help brands tell their story uh, using technology, which is kind of a good thing. Advertising is dead, long live the idea. I only hate these kind of comments, uh, basically because they're supposed to be controversial and get in uh, media. There's no journalists here, are there? Um, basically, this, this is kind of sums up part of the reason I left uh, working as an advertising creative and went to Google. It basically, it's, it's about the diversification of ideas, it's where the idea comes from, is it really that important? Clients are, are spreading out, there's a lot more agencies, there's a lot of boutique agencies out there now. Where the idea comes from isn't as important as how you bring that to life and what the idea is. And I have the luxury of working across pretty much every client that works with Google, um, which is most of them, uh, and then also being able to walk into to most places and, and getting a positive reaction, which is not something that happens a lot in advertising anymore. Fun fact, uh, most of, or half of creative jobs now are actually in the, uh, in the space outside of creative uh, industries, which is great. Um, that's not me looking for a job in a startup. I'm actually pretty happy. Uh, but there are a lot of, uh, there's a big change from 2010, uh, which was only 30%. So, yeah. Um, technology. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I look at technology as a creative now, not as like this thing that we want to use every day. I think it's, it's more about a new medium that we can play in. There's still the, still the core insight that you have to have. You still have to have a, a human insight. Uh, to, to lead off before you start charging into execution. And I think that's part of the reason that a place like Google was hiring uh, creative, creative people. We basically have the ability to look at a problem and figure out what the core 
hole is that you're not thinking about and how we, how we make that work. And we've kind of played across the board in different technologies. We still do this, the traditional sort of writing um, scripts for hype reels and content pieces and that kind of thing. But usually uh, we like to play in the more uh, utility side of things. Having said that, let's show you some of the work we've done. This technically actually isn't something I did while at the zoo. Uh, my creative partner and I, this is the last thing we did before we left uh, Sachi and Sachi when we came to the zoo. I put this in here sneakily because I think it's, it's, it's a great piece of work. Um, is because it kind of shows the utility that we were sort of thinking in and probably why we were attracted to something like Google. We like to do things that don't just tell a story, they actually have a, a use. Uh, it gives people and consumers a, a experience of the brand beyond just the message that they're being drilled on. Over 40% of mums have never thought to take their child for an eye test. So OPSM created Penny the Pirate, the bedtime story that helps parents screen their child's vision as they read to them. Available as a book and tablet storybook app, Penny the Pirate follows the journey of a young girl as she tries to become captain of the mighty pickle. She has to plunder treasure, read the captain's log, and spot sails in the distance to prove she's a worthy leader of this brutish bunch of pirates. With the help of children's author illustrator Kevin Waldron and the Department of Optometry and Vision Sciences at the University of Melbourne, this story took clinical eye tests and turned them into an illustrated children's book to help parents get a better understanding of their child's eye health. The story is also being used by OPSM's charity OneSight, reaching children in need across Australia. OPSM is rolling out the book and app across its store network, as well as in schools and in libraries. So, by turning an eye screening into a story, this could be the most important thing you read with your child. So yeah, it's something that I was really happy and proud to be part of because it wasn't just like, hey, buy more classes for your kids. It was kind of something that helped people do and experience the brand and their brand values uh, and actually get something out of it at the end of the day. Pedigree Found, um, this is a great example of how we collaborate with creative agencies. Uh, we, and we, we get a lot of uh, early iteration um, products and platforms and new features and that kind of thing a lot earlier than most people find out about it. So we have the luxury of like taking what that could be, playing with it, and then taking it to a creative agency and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And that's exactly what happened with this. Um, we took it to uh, an update to the GDN network and the way that we roll out uh, creative across that. And it basically changed from 15 minutes down to a second. So it was, well, what, what time does it matter? Like seconds count? Uh, and Pedigree was the perfect client for it, and Cleanser did a great job of pulling this together and made a great campaign. Losing your dog is a heartbreaking ordeal, which is why we created Pedigree Found. The free loss dog alert that moves faster than your dog, without the cost or complexity of a GPS tag. You just register your dog with found, and then, if they ever go missing, you simply push one button. Within seconds, thousands of lost dog alerts are posted across mobile ads in a two and a half kilometer radius, activating an army of scouts that will get your dog home safely and quickly. Missing dog posters and neighborhood flyers have long been a way to let locals know you've lost your pooch. Now a new smartphone app aims to do the same thing. So this technology is really uh, one of the first in terms of utilizing our Google Display Network as well as Dynamic Creative to deliver our real-time message in a very fine range. This goes way beyond just creating that. Working with Google will develop a new way to use display effects that can combine uh, the buying power of Mars with real-time geotargeted communication to help solve deeply personal localized problems. I actually skipped results because it's an old case study and I know the guy's going to show up and update one this afternoon um, at the panel, so I'd urge you to go on to that and check it out because it, uh, it's a really interesting um, project and something that people should know about. Um, finally, this is a project out of our Tokyo team. Um, I thought I'd show you something a little bit straighter and more retail -y. 
It's uh, for Lux Sakura, a uh, limited edition body wash with cherry blossoms in it. So we were tasked with the, the brief to come up with something that would uh, use a, uh, like Google Street View uh, and a depth API for that. Uh, and I think it's, it's just really interesting. I'll, I'll play the case study, but the best part about it was at the end of the experience, you could um, choose the place that you wanted uh, cherry blossoms to be planted on the street. Uh, and then they were going to plant trees. And the client actually axed that part of it. And then because people were so into it, they've actually brought it back. And I think yesterday I saw a photo on Instagram of one of the creators up there, and they're actually at, the, at the, uh, one of the tree places uh, and, and picking the trees out, which is great. So they're going to roll it up there soon. I apologize if the voiceover is Sakura is a national symbol of Japanese beauty. In 2013, the Japanese government created So 
So typically when we're exploring solutions for things, we try and do things that most people have access to or have the ability to access. Um, so something like the, the found example was using a mobile app. Like that's pretty simple to download and get involved with. Something like um, we use it, we're doing a lot of stuff now with Bluetooth, uh, low energy Bluetooth beacons uh, with NFC. NFC is a tricky one because it's kind of half of uh, mobile devices don't really like it, which turns it off for a lot of people. But as Google and Android, we can get away with it. Um, and we're doing a lot of things with geolocation and Chrome as well, because that being a pretty large market share with Chrome. Another thing to look at is whether you're augmenting the experience or overcomplicating it. Uh, it's, it's easy. I love using the analogy of the, uh, the NASA pen. They spent millions of dollars on uh, creating this pen that would work in zero gravity, and the Russians are just like, well, we'll use a pencil. It's way easier. I hate that it's not a real story. I wish it was. Um, Unfortunately, but we, we often do that as well. We'll be like, what if we took this thing, we put a whole bunch of cool tech in it, and suddenly you can monitor your heart rate through a, an eye patch? It doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, so just be very aware of making sure you're, you're actually helping the process or making it easier or augmenting the experience rather than overcomplicating it. Now you've come up with a great solution, and we hope you have, um, and then we have to try and sell that idea through the agency to the brand. So hopefully, um, Everyone's been on board from the start, but kind of you run a lot of uh, little workshops and kept everyone up to date with how, how you're progressing, and kept everyone interested, give them little teasers if you need to. Um, so they're at the point where they're really excited to see what you've got. How do you do that? Uh, prototyping, prototyping, pretzel, pretzel typing is not actually a thing, I suppose I don't because I need three. Um, I don't like terms like this, it's really frustrating when you walk into a client or an agency and they're like, yeah, let's do a prototype. You don't need to do a prototype every time. It's actually better if you really think about who you're talking to, and, <coughs> sorry, who your audience is, and, and the best way to explain the idea. Uh, so there's hype reels, you can do proof of concept videos. The most important thing is actually working out if it works or not, if it's a viable product uh, or a viable uh, platform. So we do a lot of research with different vendors around whether or not the idea is actually going to work in the, the minimal viable product that we're actually talking about. Um, so that brings me to my next point. Who is actually going to do the prototyping, pretzel typing, whatever you're talking about? We have a rather large uh, library of friends who help us do the stuff that we come up with. Most of them um, like us, but then some of, us, some of them are like, how do you keep bringing us these crazy ideas? Um, I think it's really important to talk to people who are specialists in whatever the field is you're working on, whether it's Bluetooth, you go to the Bluetooth specialist. If it's, um, if it's the maps guys, we've got them internally, so we're pretty fine. Whatever it is, you want to talk to the guys who are actually ultimately going to end up building it as well, because it puts the onus on them to do due diligence in the early stages of development. In terms of who pays for it, uh, we're lucky in that we have a production budget uh, to spend on building these kinds of things to get buy-in from a client later on down, down the road, so we use that sparingly because we'd rather spend it on some of the bigger projects. Uh, but obviously this comes down to IP issues, it comes down to your contracts and uh, retainers and stuff like that, so obviously take that into account. Yay, you sell the idea, or we sell the idea. Um, now you have to deliver it. Typically we'll stand back, uh, Tara and I, our creative partner, will, will stand back at this, at this point and hand it over to uh, the creative agency to execute what that idea looks like, feels like, how people interact with that, that kind of thing. Um, there are always going to be niggly little problems along the way. Hopefully if you've done a good job of managing expectations with the client up to this point, they're going to be kind of on board with how that develops across the, across the time frame, but there are always going to be problems, uh, but that's why we have producers to sort that stuff out, which is great. Congratulations, um, we made something, which is great. <laughs> My LAS has dropped off. Um, it's, it's a good feeling when you finally get it out, so stick to it, stick to your guns, get it out there, and work, work hard on the early stages so that when you get to this point it actually does feel like you've, you've actually achieved something and you haven't watered down a really cool project or, or um, product. Thanks.
If you have any questions, please cue in on the side, and we can start off like that. Yeah, go there. Hi, thank you for sharing today. Uh, the first, I uh, have two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. It's two technologies. Sorry, can you repeat? It's uh, AR or VR, augmented reality or virtual reality. So my first question is, uh, what do you think, which one can we apply to the business at first? And what, which area is school for the song? The second question is come back to, back to the virtual reality. You know, the virtual reality industry has three different branches. It's instead of a software provider or hardware provider or the, or the content provider, and the three articles and stuff like that. So what, what position do Google have to focus on hardware to do something like Google Glasses or VR or just to, to the prepare an OS for the whole system or I just was pushing up in the world. I have to be very careful answering this one. Uh, we obviously, with this year for us, we've got a big push on um, on VR uh, and in particular 360 video for the YouTube platform. Yes. So we've done a lot of work on, on how that how that interacts, and it's all available now. You, you just released an SDK uh, for the binaural sound, which is an sure. incredible uh, thing. If you've seen that, you should definitely go look at it. Yep. I I don't want to say go either way. Like I think you can do both together. I definitely think. Uh, VR is, is probably going to be bigger because ultimately AR over the top of that VR is going to be pretty interesting when you get to the point of putting on a pair of goggles and then having the real environment be interacted with. And if you, I think that's that's probably where it's going. I think that's just quietly where some of the projects we're playing uh, on are uh, going, hopefully. Um, and what was the second part of the question? What, what was she trade on? Uh, so, what my question is more about uh, which, which technology of AR or VR we can apply to the business. The second part is, uh, if, if the second part of the question is, what's Google saying? What's, which part of the Google first? Hardware, software, or content, or well, something mm -hmm. else? Well, we, I mean, we're doing this, this Google's uh, Jump uh, and Odyssey cameras. We're working with, the, we've got a, a crazy amount of processing and behind doing stereoscopic uh, 360 uh, video, but I think a lot of people are playing in that space. Um, I really can't say, dude. I don't want to. I don't want to put words in my mouth, or words in my mouth about it and get in trouble later on from the, the higher ups. We, I, I think, with VR, it's, no one's really nailed it yet. Like, no one's sure. done a yeah. content yeah. piece that I've oh, gone. Oh, oh crap, that's yeah. awesome. Sure. I think Expeditions is a great example of what's possible with it. Mm. So I think definitely the, the, the hardware and the software stuff's going to go. But I think there's a huge gap in the content side. Like no one's doing it. And for as a business case study. Just chucking a 360 camera on stage and filming a band, I think that's crap. Like, that's not a good use of 360. Yeah. If you can find places that it fits, uh, I know there's a lot of stuff in the auto area where people are putting them in cars and in test drives and that kind of thing. That's getting closer, but uh, yeah, I, I can't say I've seen anything that's been nailed yet, so I would be thinking around where you could use that in, in the best way. I think shared VR experiences are amazing. Yeah. So the expedition thing.
now at TEDx at Lundin. Shakira is top leader in leadership, empowerment, and entrepreneurship for all audiences. Please welcome Shakira to the stage. And her